I've got eight bulls here which I've selected out of that group. I think there's 12 or 15 left. Uh, what I've done, I've, I've just looked, I've got no data information. I'm just looking at the, the shape, that package, um, and the masculinity, test size, masculinity of the animals. So I'm just going to move them around a little bit and you can have a look at them. So what uh, they're going to do with these bulls, they're going to put them with yearling heifers. And then after the calves are born next year, do a DNA test and see which bull or two bulls gave the most calves. And that's the way how we'd select for fertility. Ideally, what we should have had from these bulls is their mother's fertility records, uh, which we don't have at the moment. They all obviously calved regularly, but there will still be a difference in their fertility, which we haven't been able to identify. The mother of the white face one uh, got bred 40 days after calving. That's the JJ, the fat red cow. How do you know it's fertility and not dominant? Sorry? Well, how do you define the most fertile bull? Well, how did you how do you define the most fertile bull? How would you define it? Well, if you're selecting for the most fertile bull in dom well, if one's more dominant than the other, but when I think of selection for fertility, I'm thinking of the maternal side of the cow. Well, they would be selected from very fertile cows. Excuse me. They would be se selected from fertile cows, the top ten or twenty or thirty percent. You're not. You're just trying to find. The bull that's breeding the most cows. But we select them from the most fertile cows. So they come from the top 20 or 30 percent. My definition of bull fertility is the bull that sires the most cows in a multi sizing situation. I don't know how else one could define bull fertility. As long as the, the bulls come from fertile cows, that's, that's a prerequisite, obviously. Top 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the most fertile cows. And then the bulls would also have to be selected, which we haven't done here. I just done it by eye. They would have to be selected for um, grass conversion efficiency, uh, maturity rate of 12 months. The fastest maturing bulls are the ones we select, but by looking by eye, I'm sure we've got the fastest maturing here. We might have made one or two mistakes, but generally speaking, that would be here. And then the final test would be the, the, the bulls that saw the most calves. That would be your option to collect semen from a bull like that and use them wholesale in the herd, as many cows as you can. Were these bulls born like last June or? Yes, sir. Last year? An average. June, July. Some were born in early August. When did you wean them? Oh, when they were nine months old and on an average, so from eight, nine, seven, eight, nine. Okay. I would say the two best bulls are the ones standing next to each other here. That one here and this one here. What, what do you see when you look at them? Well, I just look at the package, how full it is, how full they fill that package. I also look at uh, masculinity, yeah. they're all very masculine, tester size, they're all good testers. Uh, there are bulls that are left behind here that haven't got the muscling, that are taller and very slab-sided. We don't want bulls like that. Um, that particular good red cow we saw yesterday, that's a... That's she was three months old, she will follow the cows in feed all day long. That's a very good indication, yeah, of uh, hormonal balance, masculinity. And you can also see the defined muscling is starting to show. The muscle definition, which is very important, that's an indication of high testosterone levels. Particularly at a young age like this, it's exceptional to get that. So you're going to sell these after you run them with the heifers? Or you'll keep a few and sell some? Those over there are for sale. Uh, of those bulls, four are for sale. That's the big bulls? Yes, sir. And uh, these will eventually be for sale too, but I don't know where. It depends on the bar. Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of hard to sell bulls after you sort it out. Though. After you hard? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing. There's a difference between. It's hard to sell those after you've sorted these out. There's a difference between being I a buyer and a seller. After I use them. <laughs> Once or two years, if I get a better replacement, I will sell them. Yeah. Why do I need them for? I have a better one mm. now. Well, this is if, if you if you bring along the lines we suggest, after two or three years, they obsolete. They are obsolete. You have to select right. them. In fact, they, you've got eight young bulls here. My, uh, next year, you might only need four. Right. After a year. So, but then you've done the test and you know which four you're going to keep. If you look at the bigger bulls, the larger bulls. Jaime? Let's look at the bigger ones. I think so. Do you want to have a look at the mature ones? 
Well, these are three of the better of the older bulls. Yeah, I would say those two are the best. Those two bulls in front there. This uh, one and that one, right? Even this one? No, I'd say this one. Oh, just say yeah, this one. Yeah. Okay. Mm. They're very similar, but I would think these two go to get more together. That's an exceptional bull. He's limping because of the fighting. They will, obviously, as bulls, or oh, they will fight. And he's an older bull, so they will gang up against him. But they're very masculine bulls. Um, they've got very good sheaths. They've um, well adapted. Good meat to bone ratio. What they lack as a breed is, is muscling. Um, that, that is something one, one has to be aware of. But these are better muscled out of animals, but they do lack muscling. But they can be combined in composite breeding with well muscled uh, breeds, and you'll have a very good composite. This is what I used when I formed my, uh, bred my composite that I showed photographs of yesterday. Very clean. Mm. No harm. It's a magnet. <laughs> well, it's just clean. You're right now. <laughs> One had a lot, the two of them had a lot of heifers. How, how do you know that? Because I put them for uh, 15 days before with the cows. Because the 337, he was done the same in, in uh, New Mexico. Mm. And he threw two, like 70% heifers. Mm. So I wanted to know if these ones, which I like, would do the same. So I put them together. And yes, he kept up 70% heifers for oh. the first. Days. So, uh, since we want to increase the herd size, that's important. And it's a neat idea to present here that you can take your very best two or that you think might throw heifers and put them in for 15 days first. And find out. Before they kill themselves, you add a few more. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the winter, when we feed protein supplements, this one never eats protein, it's always grazing. So that's a good attribute that I like, that he doesn't require the protein supplement to maintain his body condition. This one. The others, I don't know because they all eat protein. He's looking very nice now. It's very nice, yeah. Very, nice. Mm -hmm. very deep body, this one. Mm -hmm. The deepest of them all. How old is that one? Yeah, he will be... Uh, Six years old. This will be maybe seven or, or five, six, and eight, something like that. But Johan tells me this breed, uh, they can keep breeding till they are like, how, many, how old? Well, at, over 12 years they will still breed, maybe some more. They are long lived. We have cows that are 15 and 15 years old. He loves his tail due to the blizzards in New Mexico. Yeah, so there are three good bulls there. It's, it's, one, one will be very subjective if you had to probably uh, select one bull out of the whole lot because they're, they're very similar. So one has to be careful in terms of your assessment of animals. Using them on a, a well muscled breed, you'd want a 50% cross and then breed that back to the herd? Or? In the southern United States, I would say 50% cross would be very close to ideal. In the more Midwest, I would say about a quarter with Shona blood. Um, but I think even with a quarter blood, you could probably get away with it. If you have an adapted type of breed here, yeah, like your Brangus or one of those breeds, even just a quarter of that blood. So, so, so here, how would you cross them? How would create your composite? Well, it depends what you area. depends what you have. If you have Brangus, I, if you have Brangus. well, I think I, the first half cross would be a very good animal. Okay. And you cross between them? Then, I, if if I had, if I had enough, if I was happy with the first combination, I would close the herd. If I had enough animals, then I would breed within the herd, select within. And breeding half brother and half sister for many generations is not a problem, not at all. If you're selecting for the right criteria. Uh, I would, I would never intentionally inbreed, in other words, I wouldn't put a, a, a bull on his daughters or granddaughters. And the other way of, of doing it is if you, if, you, if, you have, if you want to improve your genetics quickly, then you have to have a quick genetic turnover as well. So your bulls, you only 
use once or twice or two years or three years if it's a very good bull and you replace him by his sons. Just carry on doing it that way. Even half Angus, uh, half Moshona with Angus here would be a very, very good combination. Because you get the keep muscling. Keep a half load out of breeding these bulls. Keep a half load between them, Moshona and a Rangus cow. Uh, in this environment, I would, yes. Yeah. To breed back to Rangus cow? No, I would, I would, I would, I would, no, I would have, no. I'd say a quarter maybe further up. But down here, I would say half. Even Brangus, I would go to half. The, it's not that they're giving more adaptation to Brangus, it's that they're bringing the frame size down, which is more important, I think. What you do is you put a machona board to the Brangus cows till they, till they die. They're always a machona. And the offspring you cross it. Into breed. That's, that's what I would suggest. How can you interbreed and be safe? Did you say half sister and half? If, if, you, it's not a pro if you just uh, use your best bulls and your best heifers every year, it's not a problem. They can have the same size? They can yes. Have the same I've been doing it since 1980 and the herd I got it from has been doing it for probably many, many years prior to that. Breed and half, brothers and half. Yes. Yeah. It's not a problem. What about uh, sons from others? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go that way. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, there'd be the odd bull that will go to his mother, but that would be just his chance encounter. Uh, because you're using young bulls and young heifers, and then you're using those bulls maybe once or twice after that. I, I wouldn't go out of my way to keep a bull away from his mother, but I wouldn't specifically put him on his granddaughters or daughters. That's what, how important is this selection. Uh, when we first brought the cows, they were pregnant with 50 different bulls, no selection. Last year we used only this bull and preferably those, this one and that one at first. And they were the ones dominant and they gave the most progeny. So you can see the bull calf now and they look a lot like, like them too. So we, I can see uh, very many bull calves that are going to be good right now. When with those there weren't so, so many good ones. So when you start selecting this way, uh, you increase your chances of getting an exceptional animal to improve your your You know, I know people are worried about inbreeding, but if you think about it, how do you uh, select within a closed herd without inbreeding? Because all your best animals are related. You have cow families that always have produced good progeny. Lion, lion well, it's lion breeding. Half brother and half sister would be probably closer to lion breeding. Um, but inbreeding itself, where you specifically put a, a, a bull onto his daughters or granddaughters, I wouldn't recommend. I know there have been cases where they've had good results. But half brother and half sister, I think forever wouldn't be a problem. To start with, though, you have to have the well adapted. Uh, the, the, the first, the first, well adapted, yes. The, fir the first step is to uh, select your breeds. Yes. The second step, which is more important, you select the right types within those breeds. Right. The third step that's most important is a selection that carries you... The, the, Selecting your, your breeding stock. Exactly. When breeding. you've closed your herd, the selection that takes place after that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most important. Oh yeah, he hears the sound, he wants it. Isn't that something? Uh, now, could you, could you just put that out in the pasture and they might go through it by themselves? I'm sure trained you can. Well, I, I wouldn't. If you have a small, like a little bud box, you'd be able to do it. Yeah, we got three cents off it. Once they are trained, it's not fun. We're trained them. Uh, a dairyman friend of mine said, put a long channel up. There, so that when they get up there, they can't turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. They have to go through. Mm -hmm. And once they've done it a few times and it doesn't hurt, they love it. Yeah, they know what it's doing. These guys are hesitating a little bit. They didn't want. Nobody wanted to be the first one. And really fat. Uh -huh. You want them to go slowly so the flies have a time to. Just fly off and get caught in a like a vortex of air. Air flows on the left side and draws it on the right side and on the tree. Rather than hesitating, I'd say they're fighting over it. Yeah. yeah. So just the first one hesitates. I mean, it's mm. they got to see their buddy go in first. Nobody's hanging back yeah. and saying, "I don't want to do this." Mm. Nobody.
We were thinking about doing this in the paddock shift out there, but you need to take a generator. Ah. So I want to try with the, that dimension If that doesn't work, then we will do it. Well, the, the they, they, there's another one that you can make that... Was it you that was telling me about it? It's just, <laughs> no. It doesn't have any power. It's just, I, I know about that, but it's not very effective. No. <laughs> when you shut it, there is a, a, a door that opens and they all yeah. fly to a... To a screen, and you can see them all there, uh, yeah. thousands of them. Oh. Then they start dying with the sound, and they fall into a filter. Yeah, and you can take them. Out. Then you put them in the compost. Right? Uh, no, the to the chicken. <laughs> chicken feed. Okay, finished. Thank you very much. Though.